However, however, there was also the influence of unrelated causes here. Peter Stepanovich indeed had certain designs on his parent. In my opinion, he meant to bring the old man to despair and thus push him into some outright scandal of a certain sort. He needed this for some further unrelated purposes of which we shall speak later. At that time, he accumulated a great multitude of such diverse designs and calculations, almost all of them fantastic, of course. Besides Stepan Trevimovich, he had in mind yet another martyr. Generally, he had not a few martyrs, as it turned out afterwards, but he was especially counting on this one, and it was Mr. von Lemp himself. Andrei Antonovich von Lemk belonged to that favored by nature tribe, which in Russia, according to the records, numbers several hundred thousand, and which is itself perhaps unaware that within her, by its sheer mass, it constitutes a strictly organized union. Not an intentional or invented union, to be sure, but one existing of itself for the entire tribe, without words or agreements, as something morally obligatory, and consisting in the mutual support of all members of this tribe by each other, always, everywhere, and in whatever circumstances. Andrei Antonovich had the honor of being educated in one of those higher Russian institutions filled with young men from families well endowed with connections or wealth. The students of this institution were intended, almost immediately upon finish finishing their studies, to occupy rather significant positions in one of the departments of the government service. Andrei Antonovich had one uncle who was a lieutenant colonel in the engineers and another who was a baker, yet he wormed his way into this higher school and met there quite a few similar tribesmen. He was a merry companion, quite dull as a student, but everyone liked him. And when in the upper grades, many of the young men, predominantly Russians, learned to talk about rather lofty contemporary questions and with an air as if they had only to wait till graduation and then they would resolve them all, Andrei Antonovich continued to occupy himself with the most innocent schoolboy pranks. He made everyone laugh, true, though only with quite unsophisticated escapades, cynical at most, but he set that as his goal. One time he would blow his nose somehow remarkably when the teacher addressed a question to him during a lecture, making both his comrades and the teacher laugh. Another time he would present some cynical tableau vivant in the dormitory to general applause. Or he would play, solely on his nose and quite skillfully, the overture to Fry Diavola. He was also distinguished by his deliberate slovenliness, which for some reason he found witty. In his very last year, he took to scribbling little Russian verses. His own tribal language he knew quite ungrammatically, like many of his tribe in Russia. This propensity for verse brought him together with a schoolmate, gloomy and as if downtrodden by something, the son of some poor general one of the Russians who was regarded at the Institute as a great future writer. The latter treated him patronizingly, but it so happened that three years after graduation, this gloomy comrade who had abandoned his career for the sake of Russian literature and as a consequence was already parading around in torn boots, his teeth chattering from the cold, wearing a summer coat in the depths of autumn, unexpectedly met by chance near the Enichkov bridge, his former protege, Lempka, as everyone, by the way, had called him at school. And what do you think? He did not even recognize him at first sight and stopped in surprise. Before him stood an impeccably dressed young man with wonderfully tended side whiskers of a reddish hue, wearing a pince-nez, patent leather boots, the freshest gloves, and a full-cut overcoat from Sharmer's, and with a briefcase under his arm. Lemp treated his comrade benignly, gave him his address, and invited him to call on him some evening. It also turned out that he was no longer Limpka, but Von Limp. The comrade did call on him, however, if only out of spite, at the stairway, rather unattractive and certainly not the main one, though laid with red bays, he was met and questioned by a doorkeeper. A bell rang out upstairs, but instead of the riches the visitor expected to meet, he found his Limpka in a side room, a very small one, dark and decrepit looking, divided in two by a large dark green curtain, furnished with very decrepit, though soft, dark green furniture, and with dark green shades on its narrow and high windows. Von Limp lodged with some very distant relative, a general, whose protege he was. He met his guest amiably, was serious and gracefully polite. They also talked of literature, but within decent limits. 
A servant in a white tie brought some weakish tea with small, round, dry biscuits. The comrade, out of spite, asked for seltzer water. It was served, but with some delay, and Limp seemed embarrassed at calling the servant an extra time and giving him an order. However, he himself asked whether the visitor wanted a bite to eat and was obviously pleased when the latter declined and finally left. The simple fact was that Limp was starting his career and was sponging on the general, a fellow tribesman, but an important one. At that time, he was sighing after the general's fifth daughter, and this seemed to be reciprocated. Nevertheless, when the time came, Amalia was given in marriage to an old German factory owner, an old comrade of the old general's. Andrei Antonovich did not weep much, but glued together a theater made of pipe paper. The curtain rose. The actors came out made gestures with their hands. The audience sat in their boxes. The orchestra mechanically moved their bows across the fiddles. The conductor waved his baton, and in the stalls, gentlemen and officers clapped their hands. It was all made of paper, all designed and assembled by von Lindt himself. He sat over this theater for half a year. The general purposely organized an intimate little evening. The theater was brought out for display. All five of the general's daughters, the newly wedded Amelia included, her factory owner, and many young girls and women with their Germans attentively examined and praised the theater. Then there was dancing. Limp was very pleased and soon consoled. Years passed and his career got established he always served in prominent places and always under his tribesman's command, and in the end he served his way up to quite a significant rank compared with his age. He had long wanted to marry and had long been cautiously on the lookout in secret from the authorities. He sent a novella to a magazine, but it was not published. To make up for that, he glued together an entire railway station with a train, and again it came out as a most successful little thing. People left the station with suitcases and bags, Children and dogs and got into the cars. Conductors and porters walked about. The bell rang, the signal was given, and the train started on its way. He sat for a whole year over this clever piece. But all the same, he had to get married. The circle of his acquaintances was quite wide, primarily in the German world. But he also moved in Russian spheres, through his superiors, of course. Finally, when he had already turned 38, he also received an inheritance. His uncle, the baker, died and left him a bequest of 13,000. Now it was just a matter of the right position. Mr. Von Lemke, despite the rather high cut of the sphere, sphere in which he served, was a very modest man. He would have been quite satisfied with some independent little government post, with being in charge of the delivery of government firewood or some such plum, and that for the rest of his life. But here, instead of some anticipated Mina or Ernestina, all at once, Yulia Mikhailovna turned up. His career immediately rose another degree in prominence. The modest and precise von Lemke felt that he, too, was capable of ambition. Yulia Mikhailovna owned 200 souls by the old way of reckoning, and besides that, brought big connections with her. Von Lemke, on the other hand, was handsome, and she was already past 40. Remarkably, he did really fall in love with her little by little, as he felt himself more and more a fiancé. On the morning of their wedding day, he sent her some verses. She liked it all very much. Even the verses. Forty is no joke. Soon he was awarded a certain rank and a certain decoration, and then he was appointed to our province. In preparation for coming to our town, Yulia Mikhailovna worked assiduously on her husband. In her opinion, he was not without abilities, knew how to make an entrance and show himself, knew how to listen with a grave air and say nothing, had picked up a few quite dis decent poses, could even make a speech, even had some odds and ends of ideas, and had picked up the gloss of the latest indispensable liberalism. But all the same, it troubled her that he was somehow none too receptive, and after his long, eternal search for a career was decidedly beginning to feel a need for peace. She wanted to pour her ambition into him, and he all of a sudden began gluing together a German church. The pastor came out to preach the sermon. The faithful listened, their hands piously clasped before them, one lady wiping away tears with her handkerchief, one little old man blowing his nose. Towards the end, a little organ rang out. It had been specially ordered and had already arrived from Switzerland, expense notwithstanding. Yulia Mikhailovna, even with some sort of fright, took the whole work from him as soon as she found out about it and locked it away in her drawer. 
She allowed him to write a novel instead, but on the quiet. Since then, she began to rely directly on herself alone. The trouble was that there was a fair amount of frivolity in all this in little measure. Fate had kept her too long among the old maids. Idea after idea now flashed in her ambitious and somewhat fretted mind. She nursed designs. She decidedly wanted to rule the province. Dreamed of being surrounded at once, shows her tendency. Von Limp even got somewhat frightened, though he quickly figured out with his official's tact that there was no reason at all for him to be afraid of governorship as such. The first two or three months even passed quite satisfactorily. But then Peter Stepanovich turned up and something strange began to happen. The thing was that from the very first step, the young Verkovinsky showed a decided disrespect for Andrei Antonovich and assumed some strange rights over him, and Yulia Mikhailovna, always so jealous of her husband's significance, simply refused to notice it. At least she attached no importance to it. The young man became her favorite, ate, drank, and all but slept in the house. Von Limp set about defending himself, called him young man in public, patted him patronizingly on the shoulder, but made no impression. Peter Stepanovich went on laughing in his face, as it were, even while apparently talking seriously, and said the most unexpected things to him in public. Once, on returning home, he found the young man in his study, asleep on the sofa, uninvited. The latter explained that he had stopped by and, finding no one home, had, quote, caught himself a good nap, end of quote. Von Limp was offended and again complained to his wife. Laughing at his irritability, she remarked caustically that it was he who seemed unable to put himself on a real footing, at least with her, quote, this boy, end of quote, never allowed himself any familiarity. And in all events, he was, quote, naive and fresh, though outside, outside the bounds of society, end of quote. Von Limp pouted. On that occasion, she got them to make peace. Peter Stepanovich did not really apologize, but got off with some coarse joke, which in other circumstances could have been taken as a new insult, but in the present was taken as repentance. The weak point lay in Andrei Antonovich's having made a blunder at the very beginning, namely by imparting his novel to him. Fancying him to be a fervent young man of poetry and having long dreamed of a listener, one evening, still in the first days of their acquaintance, he read two chapters to him. He listened with unconcealed boredom, yawned impolitely, uttered not a word of praise, but on leaving asked Andrei Antonovich for the manuscript so as to form an opinion at home at his leisure, and Andrei Antonovich gave it to him. Since then, though he ran by every day, he had not returned the manuscript and laughed in answer to inquiries. Finally, he announced that he had lost it then and there in the street. When she learnt of it, Yulia Mikhailovna became terribly angry with her husband. And did you tell him about your little church, too? She fluttered, almost frightened. Von Lemp decidedly took to pondering, and pondering was bad for him and was forbidden by his doctors. Aside from the fact that there turned out to be much trouble with the province, of which we shall speak later, there was another matter here, and he even suffered in his heart, not merely, merely in his official pride. On entering into marriage, Andrei Antonovich had by no means envisioned the possibility of future family strife and discord. This was not what he had always imagined in his dreams of Mina and Ernestina. He felt himself unable to endure family storms. Yulia Mikhailovna finally had a frank talk with him. You can't be angry at this, she said, if only because you are three times more sensible and immeasurably higher on the social ladder. There are many leftovers of former free-thinking ways in the boy, just mischief in my opinion. But one must be gradual, not sudden. We should cherish our young people. My way is to indulge them and keep them on the brink. But he says the devil knows what, objected Von Limp. I can't be tolerant when he asserts publicly and in my presence that the government purposely gets the people drunk on vodka so as to brutalize them and keep them from rebelling. Imagine my role when I'm forced to listen to that in front of everyone. As he said this, Von Limp recalled a conversation he had had recently with Peter Stepanovich. With the innocent aim of disarming him with his liberalism, he had shown him his own private collection of all sorts of tracts from Russia and abroad, which he had been carefully collecting since the year 59. Not really as an amateur, but merely out of healthy curiosity. 
Peter Stepanovich, having guessed his aim, stated rudely that there was more sense in one line of some tracks than in certain whole chanceries, perhaps not excluding your own. Limp cringed. But with us, it's too early, much too early, he said, almost pleadingly, pointing to the tracks. No, it's not too early. See, you're afraid, so it's not too early. But all the same, here, for example, is an invitation to destroy churches. And why not? You're an intelligent man and, of course, not a believer yourself, but you understand only too well that you need belief in order to brutalize the people. Truth is more honest than lying. I agree. I agree. I fully agree with you, but for us, it's too early. Too early, Von Limp kept, kept wincing. And what sort of government official are you after that if you yourself agree to destroy churches and march with cudgels to Petersburg and the only difference is when to do it? So rudely caught up, Limp was sorely picked. It's not that, not that. He was getting carried away. His Omor proper more and more chafed. Being a young man and above all unfamiliar with our goals, you're mistaken. You see, my dearest Peter Stepanovich, you call us officials of the government? Right. Independent officials? Right. But may I ask, how do we act? The responsibility is on us. And as a result, we serve the common cause the same as you do. We merely hold together that which you are shaking apart and which without us would go sprawling in all directions. We're not your enemies by no means. We say to you, go forward, progress. Even shake all that's old, that is, and has to be remade. But when need be, we will keep you within necessary limits and save you from yourselves. For without us, you will only set Russia tottering, depriving her of a decent appearance, while our task consists precisely in maintaining her decent appearance. Realize that you and we are mutually necessary to each other. In England, the Whigs and the Tories are also mutually necessary to each other. So, then we are the Tories, and you are the Whigs. That's precisely how I see it. Andrei Antonovich even waxed enthusiastic. Ever since Petersburg, he had enjoyed talking intelligently and liberally. And here, furthermore, no one was eavesdropping. Peter Stepanovich was silent and bore himself somehow with unusual gravity. This egged the orator on even more. Do you know that I, the master of the province, he went on, pacing the study, do you know that I, owing to the multitude of my duties, am unable to fulfill even one of them? And, on the other hand, it would be just as correct to say that there is nothing for me to do here. The whole secret is that here everything depends on the views of the government. Suppose the government even establishes a republic say, out of politics or to restrain passions. And on the other hand, parallel with that, suppose it strengthens the power of the governors. Then we governors will swallow up the republic, not just the republic, will swallow up whatever you like. I at least feel I am ready. In short, if the government sends me a telegram declaring insatiable activity, then I'll give them insatiable activity. I said here, right in their faces, my dear sirs, for the balancing and flourishing of all provincial institutions, one thing is necessary. An increase of the governor's power. You see, all these institutions, whether local or legislative, ought, so to speak, to live a double life. That is, they ought to exist. I agree that this is necessary. Well, and on the other hand, they ought at the same time not to exist, all depending on the government's view. If the notion should arise that these institutions suddenly seem necessary, I immediately have them available. If the necessity passes, no one will find them anywhere in my province. That is how I understand insatiable activity. And it cannot exist without an increase of the governor's power. 
We are talking privately, you know. I've already applied to Petersburg about the necessity for a special sentry at the door of the governor's house. I'm awaiting an answer. You need two, said Peter Stepanovich. Why two? Von Luck stopped in front of him. I don't think one will be enough to earn you respect. You surely need two. Andrei Antonovich made a wry face. You, you allow yourself, God knows what, Peter Stepanovich. You take advantage of my kindness to make caustic remarks and play some sort of benevolent curmudgeon. Well, that's as you like, Peter Stepanovich muttered. But all the same, you're paving the way for us and preparing our success. That is which us? And what success? Von Limp stared at him in surprise, but received no answer. Yulia Mikhailovna, after hearing a report of the conversation, was very displeased. But really, Von Limp defended himself. I cannot behave as a superior towards your favorite, especially when we're in private. I might have let something slip from the goodness of my heart, from all too much goodness. I didn't know you had a collection of tracts. Kindly show it to me. But, but he asked to take it for a day. And once again, you gave it? Yulia Mikhailovna became angry. What tactlessness. I'll send someone now to take it back from him. He won't give it back. I'll insist. Von Limp boiled over and even jumped up from his place. Who is he to be so feared? And who am I not to dare to do anything? Sit down and calm yourself. Yulia Mikhailovna interrupted. I will answer your first question. He came to me with excellent recommendations. He has abilities and occasionally says extremely intelligent things. Karmazinov assured me that he has connections almost everywhere and is extremely influential with the youth of the capital. And if through him I can attract them and gather them all around me, I can divert them from ruin by showing a new path for their ambition. He is devoted to me with his whole heart and heeds me in everything. But while we're indulging them, they can do devil knows what. Of course, it's an idea, Von Limp vaguely defended himself. But, but now I hear that some tracks have appeared in the district. But we heard that rumor already in the summer. Tracks, false banknotes, and whatnot. Yet nothing has been brought in. Who told you? I heard it from Von Blum. Ah, oh, spare me your Blum. And do not dare to mention him again. Yulia Mikhailovna boiled over and for about a minute was even unable to speak. Von Blum was an official from the governor's office, whom she especially hated. Of that later. Please don't worry about Verkovensky, she concluded the conversation. If he had participated in any mischief, he wouldn't talk the way he does with you and with everyone here. Phrase mongers are not dangerous. And I would even say that if something were to happen, I would be the first to learn of it through him. He is fanatically, fanatically devoted to me. I will note anticipating events that had it not been for Yulia Mikhailovna's self-importance and ambition, perhaps none of the things these bad little people managed to do here would have taken place. Much of it is her responsibility. <laughs>